Greetings again, uh, Hope Lutheran Church. Pastor Dan back again with the next in our lectures. And by the way, I'm going to turn this class into a uh, live Zoom class starting Wednesday, September 16th, I believe it is at one o'clock, which is the usual time that our midweek class met. Um, I would like to spend a lot of time on the New Testament. There's been some new research on the Gospels, and that in particular interests me more than any other part of the Bible. Don't know if we'll be there quite yet when the class starts, but I'll be sending out, or I should say someone will be sending out a link to uh, for you to connect using Zoom, or you can call in. That's not as much fun, because then you just hear it. You don't see anybody. But with Zoom, you know, you, you if you have your computer, you can see the other folks and we can engage in discussion as well as there can be questions and I think it'll be better that way. But anyway, we'll march on nevertheless uh, until that time uh, doing the lectures as I have been doing them. And today's lecture is going to be covering almost exclusively just the archaeology of what we have already been covering historically. Um, I thought it would be important for you to know something about that uh, and about the science of archaeology in general. Archaeology is a science in the sense that it's based on evidence that is analyzed using scientific uh, methods and instruments. Um, but it's important to understand that archaeology can't tell us the whole s story. In other words, we can't derive just from the archaeological evidence exactly what happened. Um, and whether or not the biblical record as it's written is historically accurate. And what I mean by accurate is uh, in the sense that what it says happened happened the way it says it did. Uh, you know, the biblical record was written for reasons other than to convey history for history's sake. The main character in the Bible is God, and you can't, there's no archaeological evidence that can say anything or tell us anything about God's presence at the time what God may or may not have said to Samuel or anyone else at the time. Whether or not God made a covenant with David is not something an archaeologist can, can uncover. So you have to bear in mind that with the Bible, we don't have a history, just a plain history book. We have a book that is intended to be... Uh, um, revelatory of the God of the ancient Hebrews, who indeed, uh, when we get to the New Testament, who indeed did appear in the form of a human being. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet. And there is evidence, I think, that Jesus was who we think he was. That is, when I say we, I mean Christians. Um, I think the evidence is really rather overwhelming that he was who we think he was. But in any case, um, we are uh, not there yet. 
Okay, last week we covered the period of ancient Israel of the United Monarchy, or I should say we did simply a synopsis of it. We didn't do a lot of detail. Uh, the biblical record tells a story of uh, major conquests under King David. In fact, at the end of David's reign, according to the biblical record, the kingdom of the Hebrews extended from well into the Sinai Peninsula, the desert there that they wandered through on their way to the Promised Land under Moses, that it extended from there all the way up to just south of Aleppo in uh, modern-day Syria. That is a large piece of territory. Um, moreover, according to the biblical record, under King Solomon, David's son, with Bathsheba, the woman with whom he committed adultery, um, uh, according to the biblical record, the kingdom of Israel became extremely wealthy, that Solomon was a man of great wealth. He had an enormous harem. Um, he had a large army. He built, you know, all kind. there were all kinds of building projects. And he had the respect of all the rulers in the regions. In fact... It is said the Queen of Sheba actually came and visited Solomon at one point. Um, but the most important and probably most reliable um, bit of information about Solomon is that he built the temple in Jerusalem. Every generation since has acknowledged that it was Solomon who built the temple, that there was, an, there was a temple there, and that it was Solomon who built it. So I don't think there's any doubt about that. Unfortunately, we cannot dig far enough underneath the Temple Mount to discover any evidence that might be left behind regarding that temple. Now, the Bible describes the temple in great detail, so we can, be, we can paint pictures of it, we can do graphs and diagrams and all the rest of it based on biblical information, but uh, <clears throat> the Temple Mount, you see, at this point in time, is a sacred site for Muslims. And the Israeli government has given control of the Temple Mount over to um, a group of Muslims who police the area to make sure nothing goes on up there that isn't supposed to. So where the temple, where the Jewish temple used to be, there now sits the Dome of the Rock over the top of what was thought to be Mount Moriah, where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. The rock, you can see it um, if you enter the temple, the Dome of the Rock. But if you're not a Muslim, you can't go in there anymore. They used to let us in, not anymore, for whatever reason. Uh, the Temple Mount is very large. On the other side of it, well, the, the Dome of the Rock's about in the middle. On the, on the other end of it, there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is an enormous third holiest mosque in Islam. It's enormous. There again, people, non-Muslims, used to be able to visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Not anymore. The best we can do now is go up on the Temple Mount and keep our mouths shut because you can't read from the Bible, you can't say a prayer, you can't have a worship service, you can't do anything like that up there now. But in any case, uh, with respect to archaeology, because it's a holy site, there's no digging allowed underneath the Temple Mount. 
which is where, if there was anything left of the temple, where it would be. Recall that Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in the 6th century. And uh, the treasures of the temple, you know, we have no idea what may have happened to the Ark of the Covenant because the treasures of the temple were robbed many times. Or let me put it this way, not robbed so much as taken. Um, for example... Remember, we left off with King Rehoboam in Judah last time. Uh, shortly after Rehoboam took the reins of power in Judah, you know, the northern kingdom split off, grabbed the name of Israel. Uh, and so the southern kingdom of Judah, Rehoboam, was uh, reigning there, and it wasn't long thereafter that the king of, or the pharaoh, I should say, of Egypt laid siege to Jerusalem. And in order to get rid of him, they had to pay a ransom, which took all the treasures of the temple. So off they went with Shishak or Shoshank or however you want to pronounce his name. I think that's the guy that uh, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, the theory was he took the, <laughs> the the Ark of the Covenant, buried it in Egypt, and of course, um, what's his name again? Um, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones found found it there. Um, that that that's the theory anyway. Well, we'll never know because we can't dig underneath the Temple Mount. So that makes uh, evidence with respect to Solomon's Temple impossible to gather. So, um, uh, however, uh, we do have information relating to Jerusalem. Not a lot. Because bear in mind, Jerusalem is still a city. It's still there. Uh, it's been rebuilt, as I said several times. Uh, the old city that's there now was rebuilt in the Middle Ages. And the city that was there at the time of David is now consists of residences where Palestinians live. So you're not going to be able to dig there either. So, um, but, but there has been some archaeological activity in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, we have, for example, unearthed one of the first century streets that were there at the time of Jesus. And uh, several other important sites relating to the New Testament, not so much the old, but, um, uh, the, oh, the, uh, Hezekiah's tunnel uh, was found. Uh, a number of things were found. Um, one thing is for sure. Um, what we have been able to discover about Jerusalem this far back, we're talking now around the turn of the millennium, 1000 B.C., is that it was definitely not a city. It was very small, maybe a large village. Um, and uh, it, so, you know, the idea that David conquered this large city and turned it into a, a major capital with a large population is out of the question. It was just a small settlement at the time. Um, uh, some more about that in a minute, but before I get to that, I want to say something about the science of archaeology because not all archaeologists agree, as there is different schools of thought in other disciplines, there's different schools of thought in archaeology as well. 
there are basically, I think, three. I'm not an expert on this subject, but what little I've read, three basic schools of thought. The first being the minimalists. And minimalists are called minimalists precisely because they believe in a minimal amount of what's in the Bible. Um, when it comes to David and Solomon, the minimalists believe that they didn't even exist, that they were just created out of whole cloth by authors later in time um, for their own reasons. There was no such person as David or Solomon. Um, these are legendary figures. Um, the minimalists come from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, probably not surprising. It's kind of cold up there. It can be difficult to concentrate in that cold weather, and you might get confused from time to time. I have a lot of experience with that because I came from North Dakota, so I know what it's like to be in cold weather. Um, I don't think the minimalists have much to offer. I'm not sure exactly why they believe what they believe because the evidence would suggest that they are dead wrong. So then the question becomes, well, why do they believe, why do they disbelieve in all of this? Um, some people have accused them of being anti-Semitic. I think that's probably not fair because we don't have any other evidence of them being anti-Semitic. But um, nevertheless, this particular school of thought, I'm not going to give much time to because I don't think they have anything to offer that is of any value. Um, perhaps it's not unusual for this school of thought to come from Denmark or Scandinavia in general, since Denmark and Scandinavia in general has become basically bastions of secularism and the churches up there are uh, there's not much life left there um, so uh, you know uh, Soren Kierkegaard who is also Danish as most of you probably know uh, back in the 19th century, he didn't think there was much Christianity in Denmark then either. Uh, and there certainly isn't now. But in any case, um, uh, the, that's the minimalists, okay? They, they don't think any of these figures even existed. Um... A couple of things about um, Jerusalem, however, and uh, this period in general that is important to understand based on archaeological evidence. Uh, I already mentioned that it was a small city. The other thing that's important to understand is that the region that comprised the kingdom of Judah is mostly desert. Uh, during this period of time, it was very sparsely populated. There, it, it didn't have land for farming, uh, so that it was mostly pastoralists, sheep herders. The villages were very small. Um, as a kingdom, Judah would have been extremely insignificant, very small, very small population, um, not much to it. So, um, you know, it could be that some of the uh, information related to Solomon may be 
embellished, okay? It certainly wasn't this lavish place that um, people think of when they think of Solomon. Uh, a couple other things related to him, you know, it's, uh, Solomon is said to have been have built large stables for his chariots and horses. He had a big army, according to the Bible, at a place called Megiddo. Megiddo has been dug and dug and dug because it is a very large tell. A tell is a is a is a mound. Okay, and different levels represent different eras in the history of that particular settlement. And it appears as if the most impressive period of time at Megiddo was not during Solomon's reign, but rather during the reigns of King Omri and Ahab during who, who reigned in the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and that makes actually a lot of sense because the northern kingdom was um, much larger than the southern kingdom of Judah. It had very fertile soil. It had abundant rainfall. Uh, it would have been much wealthier it would have had a much larger population so that there was more wealth and ability to build impressive structures um, in the northern kingdom makes a lot of sense, both historically and archaeologically. In any case, the archaeologists have dated the stables that were discovered there back to the time of King Ahab uh, of the Northern Kingdom. He was the king who married Jezebel, the one who was condemned by the prophet Elijah. You remember that story? Elijah had a uh, contest with the prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel, which is also in the northern kingdom, by the way, along the... It's a mountain on the coast. Uh, that particular part is not a plain. Most of the coast is flat, but Mount Carmel towers up um, above um, one of the highest points there. And... Uh, Uh, Elijah had a contest with the prophets of Baal who were brought there by Jezebel from the northern kingdom of Phoenicia. Um, Ahab married her in a kind of political, shall we say, alliance, so to speak, between the northern kingdom and the Phoenicians. Anyway, um, by the time that contest was over, all the prophets of Baal lost their heads. So that was the end of them. Elijah fled into the desert. Eventually he ended up down at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb as it was called in the northern kingdom. And that's when God told him in the still small voice to go back and um, do what he was supposed to do as a prophet. Okay. Um, in any case, given the fact that Megiddo was probably at its apex uh, at the time of King Ahab, um, we are not able to say that Solomon had this enormous installation with all kinds of chariots and horses. Um, that's not to say he didn't have an installation there. He probably did. It just wasn't the big place that uh, we previously believed it to have been. So, um, um, what can we say then about this p 
period of David and Solomon? Well, uh, they, they did exist. There's no doubt about that. In fact, we archaeologists have unearthed a, um, an ancient stele, uh, one of those metal things created by kings to celebrate their victories, which mentions the house of David. Okay, so that there was a King David and that um, his progeny ruled in Judah after him is in all likelihood correct, given uh, what little evidence we have. I'm not sure that anything would have mentioned the house of David if that was not the case. Um, and that Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, that's not really um, disputed. So these kings did um, rule and... Um, they were there, it's just that the kingdom probably was not as large, certainly not as wealthy, and they may not have been the absolute rulers that are uh, portrayed in the Bible. However, let me say once again that archaeology in and of itself can't confirm or deny that. Uh, all we can say is that the evidence that we have thus far does not confirm it. Um, and it's also important to know that archaeological evidence uh, is constantly changing because archaeological digs are constantly going on. Um, all it requires, like everything else, is a grant of money from somebody, and um, off they go. They can usually find volunteers to help them um, sift through uh, the uh, artifacts that are left behind. In most cases, these archaeological sites find a lot of po pottery. That's mostly what they find. But they, they, they find also these structures. Um, I do want to mention that there is a city in the south uh, of, uh, it would have been in the kingdom of Judah when there was two kingdoms called Arad. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. One of the southernmost outposts uh, of the kingdom where both David and Solomon built a kind of citadel, uh, that has been excavated and that apparently has been confirmed. So, so, that, so we have that. Um, and... Um, um, That's about, oh, and there is one other place as well. Recall when King Saul was fighting with David. Uh, they found each other uh, at a spring near the Dead Sea called Ein Gedi, which is a, a place where they grow date palms now. And... Um, which they do to this day, and I believe they were there back then as well, um, that that place is still there, and so we have confirmed the, the, the place. Um, um, but, uh, you know, just to conclude this part of it, the the kingdom of Israel at the time of the United Monarchy was probably not quite as large as the Bible suggests from the Sinai Peninsula all the way up to Aleppo. Um, 
Jerusalem had Solomon's temple. However, it was a rather small settlement at the time. And kings David and Solomon's rule, I think, probably was more tenuous with respect to the ten northern tribes than... Um, than we may want to believe. Uh, in any case, um, um, we do know that they were real kings, unlike the judgment of the minimalists up there in cold Copenhagen. Okay, um... I also want to mention that when we get to just to talk a little bit more about how archaeology works and the outline of the story up to this point, what archaeology suggests, uh, if you put the archaeological findings next to the biblical story, the outline of the biblical story, how do the two square? Well, actually, they square quite well. Um, if you go all the way back to the time of uh, slavery in Egypt, while there's no record of a uh, slave rebellion among the Egyptian documents, nevertheless, we do know that the places mentioned in the Old Testament as being places where the Hebrew slaves worked were, in fact, being built at that time. So that squares. Uh, we do know that Semitic peoples were migrating to Canaan at the time that the Exodus took place. So that squares, historically. We do know that um, at the time of Joshua, there begins to appear more and more Hebrew settlements in the hill country of Canaan. So that squares in terms of the period of time. Uh, there weren't the wars recorded in the book of Joshua. There were some conflicts um, uh, that, that could have been uh, gone back to that period, but uh, not all of them recorded in the Bible. But nevertheless, that Hebrew uh, tribes were moving into Canaan at the time described in the Bible is a fact. Um, and that they were growing over time. Um, that they consisted of tribal groups is a fact, and that there were kind of chieftains who ruled, uh, and, and elders, uh, and, and chieftains, kings, it depends on, you know, the terminology you want to use, they were thought of similarly. Um, and tribal elders are mentioned in the Bible a lot. We, uh, that is not in dispute. There were, there were tribal elders, uh, who helped to rule. And, uh, in fact, in some places, um, out at the city gate, there has been unearthed places where the king would have sat and the tribal elders sat around the king. So we've got that as well. Um, moving ahead just a little bit, um, because this also helps to uh, understand how archaeology works, um, when you get to the period when the northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrian conquest, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah increases in population many-fold, 
which makes sense. People may from the northern kingdom have fled to the southern kingdom. That is when Jerusalem actually turns into a city. Um, so many mig migrants come down from the northern kingdom when the Assyrians uh, destroy it, uh, that Jerusalem grows 10, 20 fold uh, and turns into a bona fide city at that point. And the kingdom of Judah becomes a respectable kingdom um, uh, at, at this particular point in time. Um, also, interestingly, um, when the Babylonians uh, laid siege to Jerusalem before the fall of the southern kingdom, the Bible records that the people were reduced to eating grass because they couldn't get food into the city, right? So... Did that really happen? Well, turns out it did because some archaeologists uh, investigated the ancient privies and discovered that, in fact, the people were eating grass. Um, I mention that simply as by way of demonstrating how archaeological evidence can help us to um, verify much of what's in the Bible. And there's no reason to believe that the basic outline of the history as it's recorded in the Bible is the way it was. Um, with some um, revisions, of course, but the basic outline is uh, as it was, I believe, anyway. And um, um, it'll be interesting to watch in the future um, as more archaeological digs are uh, engaged in uh, to uh, find out more of what um, can be confirmed. One last thing uh, I would like to also mention, this is related to the New Testament. Uh, many people didn't believe that there were synagogues in Galilean villages at the time of Jesus. Uh, that was believed up till very recently, uh, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why. Um... But uh, only a few years ago, the area that consisted of Magdala, where Mary Magdalene came from, was purchased by a group, a church group, I think. And they excavated it. And what did they find? They found a synagogue from the first century that was standing there at the time of Jesus. So you can see uh, the storyline uh, in the Bible. Um, you have to, with archaeology, you have to take it with a grain of salt, especially when you consider the fact that the evidence is only spotty and that more will be unearthed as time goes by. So, um, um, in the end, the important thing is to understand that the Bible is not just about ancient Israel. It's about ancient Israel's relationship with God. And the God who is revealed in the text of the Hebrew Bible, as well as the New Testament, uh, is the main point of the story. Okay, that's going to take care of it for today. Next time, we are going to pick up 
And we're going to move fast through the kings, but we're going to pick up the reigns of the kings of Judah and Israel up to the conquest of the northern kingdom and into the period of King Josiah, who was perhaps the most important king of the southern kingdom in its history. Okay, that's it for now. Take care, everybody. See you next time.